Welcome to RGBA Colorful Tech News and Reviews. This is episode 88. My name is Alexandre Valliard-Lagasse, and I'm joined by my co-host, Tadeo Menor. Let's start with a little bit of follow-up. Uh, I think it's the third episode we discussed the Creaky, but uh, it seems to be kept in the news for some reason. Uh, the first news I have is we recently received iOS 11.3.1 with a single small fix regarding third-party screens on repairs made by third-party uh, repair shops and not official Apple-approved uh, repair shops and Apple stores. Uh, basically, there were problems with the display and the touch uh, input on the display. It seemed to be linked with a some kind of refresh rate or something that was out of whack, and because of that, the screen was kind of blocked by the OS. So they released a fix for that. Everyone now has this fix if you upgrade it to 11.3.1. But there was also a big section about security, and I was wondering if maybe that's just from from my head, I just thought about this this morning. Maybe it's to start and try to tamper with the uh, gray key uh, little box that allows people to well, well, not people, thankfully, but uh, law enforcement to hack iPhones, and that ties into the second news we have. There's actually someone who started to release this week uh, pieces of code from that gray key device. So they are asking the company uh, Gray Shift, which is the one who made this little device for two bitcoins in exchange that they would stop leaking their source code because as much as this person leaks code every day there's more and more information for apple to know how they proceed and they will eventually be blocking that technique and since gray key is probably use, using um that thing for uh for the whole business their whole business plan basically you really need to keep that secret so i don't know if that's going to stick or not, but it's uh, interesting to see. Yeah, so if this continues like that, basically there will be no more Creaky compatible with iOS 11. And I don't know if Apple will patch probably iOS 10 also, just to be on the safe side, and maybe even a special uh, security release for iOS 9, which they did in the past. So it's very rare they go back like one or two years uh, on those types of updates. But for this kind of security update, I'm pretty sure they would do it. So yeah, uh, let, let's, let's see in a couple of weeks if this release continues to leak or if uh, Gray Shift releases a couple of bitcoins for this hacker or person from the company who tries to, to make money out of that. And on the same note, there's also another news. I figure we should just put it in the follow up just so we're done with all the hacking and Gray Shift stuff. There's a company in uh, a startup basically that tries to uh, build itself a tech uh, base basically by offering $3 million for anyone who can have who can provide an iPhone or iOS or Android hack. So just provide them with the I don't know the, the how to or details on how to proceed and you'll get paid three millions and they will probably use that to do something very similar to the Grey Key team, I'm assuming. So last bit of follow up RGBA number sixty seven. Uh, we discussed the Casey Johnston post on uh, uh, on the outline regarding the MacBook Pro keyboards and crumbs that she got under or dust or whatever that she got under the keyboard. She had to get it replaced. I think that in the end she did it twice, and she was now she's saying that she's basically done with this computer, and she managed to get it purchased back by Apple. I don't know what this means. I don't know if that that even was a possibility. If you buy a device from Apple. I'm guessing you're past the 14 days uh, return tr uh, window. You can s sell it back to Apple. I think you can. There's like a return program. No, like you bring an old PC in, then they give you a credit for it, like for oh. to recycle it. Okay, yeah, but that that's like a couple hundred bucks for a three thousand dollars computer. That that's not a good thing. Or maybe she just she's like, hey, I, I write for the Virgin. I've been giving you this bunch of coverage. Take back my PC or else I'm going to complain again or something. Yeah, probably she used that uh, journalist card. Hmm. Okay. Well, she's she's basically done. So that's it for, for her. 
Uh, there's also more discussion on the podcast this week about still once again those keyboards and what Apple is going to do for the next uh, WWDC if there's going to be new computers and new keyboards or if are, are they going to say that they had problems with the keyboards probably not it might come just in the demo uh, section after the show where you can journalists can take notes and Apple can give information without being quoted for it so we'll have to see but uh, I am seriously hoping that the, the keyboard changes dr drastically, not because of the feel or the noise. I really don't care for that. And for me, it's pretty fine. I use it almost daily uh, with the keyboard now, and uh, it's pretty fine, so I don't care about the feeling or not, whatever. But just the reliability, that has to be fixed, no matter what. Yeah. How is yours? Is yours still okay? You've had it since yes. what? Now, October? Or? Yeah, October, I think. And it's not the my main keyboard, so I don't spend my whole day on it. But I do use it every day at least once uh, in meetings or stuff like that. And sometimes I even like uh, eat snacks around it. And I don't do it by willingly putting crumbs on it. But like I'm not especially uh, aware and crazy about not getting crumbs near it. Uh, but nothing ever happened. I think once there was a small resistance on a key. But after hitting it hard a couple of times, it, it fixed itself. So... But that's the only thing I have. Uh, otherwise, it's always in in a computer bag with me. And oftentimes in the past, for my previous MacBook Pro, I would have lint stuck in the ports. And in this scenario with this device, I don't have any lint getting between the display and the keyboard. So for now, I'm safe. How's yours? Yeah, mine's fine too. Um, I've had like the same thing as you there. Uh, like stuff stuck under the keyboard and you just hit on the, on the key and it, and it gets undone. But um, it's on my main computer. I don't use it at work. It's my like personal computer, so I use it every night almost, and I use it as the main keyboard. The main keyboard is a is a laptop. So, but I don't eat in front of it. Well, don't really try to eat in front of it. Yeah, no, I think I think it's it's a very particular type of dust, and it has to get lodged in a very specific place to cause problems. The issue is that with the millions of devices out there, it might happen, I don't know, maybe 10% of the time, and that 10% is a big number, and it's probably way more than what it was with the previous generation, which is probably like the 1%, because I never had any problem with the chiclet keyboards. I know people had problems at one point, but it's it's super rare. Whereas for this keyboard, every week we hear somebody, or at least I hear about somebody that has a problem with the keyboard, or just got it replaced, or they got quoted 700 bucks to replace the keyboard. So it, it makes no sense, like it, both on the reliability side of things and also on the repair side of things. It doesn't make sense to charge $700 for a replacement keyboard. And I don't care if you need to take a computer apart from the bottom and replace 12 parts. It's just badly designed. If the single most movable piece of the machine that has the most chances of basically breaking because it's the one you're touching every day. It doesn't make sense that you design this computer to be replaceable, but only with the logic board or whatever else you need to change. So, Yeah, and mine just fell out of warranty, so I'm pretty stressed that, <laughs> that um, <laughs> to get anything stuck with it or if anything happens with it, it's I'm out, I'm done. So I'm, I'm going to... I'm supposed to be paying all these costs and, and unless they be like generous and say, like, oh, oh, this is a wide known pro, uh, like a wide, a wide problem or a, a wide known or whatever big wide problem. Spread. So, but I don't think so. They're not talking about it right now. Yeah. So you, you might get something, maybe at the, the WDC, they will announce that if you had a problem with your keyboard and you're out of warranty, we'll replace it for free. And if you did some repair in the past, we'll refund them or give you like, Apple Store gift cards or whatever, and they will probably uh, extend the warranty for a couple of maybe a year, year and a half, like they did with the GPUs in 2007, 20, 20, oh, 20, and 2008. And recently, I think it was the Touch Bar and the 13 inch. So, yeah, they, they, they do that often. And also, there's a, while we're talking about this laptop, there's a, a, a not a recall, but a, there's a problem with the, bar, the, the battery swelling. For oh, the yeah. MacBook escapes, and there's a there's a page that we'll put in the show notes so you can put your serial number in. It's going to tell you if you're if you're under uh, if you fall under that category, and you could go get replaced yeah. for free. Good. 
All right, so let's start with the news. Uh, there's one piece of dark UI news that came up. Uh, WebKit supposedly has code in, inside it and maybe a technique or some compiling option to simply turn the display black as a black dark UI. Uh, so I'm pretty pretty happy because every time there's a dark mode, I'm happy. Uh, but what does this tell us? Like, is it because Apple is secretly building a dark mode for Mac OS? Most probably, uh, they are starting maybe with the apps that are external to them. So for WebKit, for a Safari, they basically share code with the WebKit organization. So they maybe start from the outside going inside, because I know that the inside, it's easy for them. They own the app, so they can basically change everything. But going through WebKit maybe allows them to to know exactly the amount of work it's going to take and plan ahead. So yeah, uh, but I'm thinking maybe there's even more to that. Maybe they haven't released a dark mode just because dark modes are just colors, but maybe they want something else. Maybe that new display, that pro display that they're going to announce in a couple of months, probably at WDC, maybe that display is an OLED display. That would be amazing. Like the We would have like a dark UI and a black UI on a 27-inch OLED display. That would be crazy. Uh, yeah, and... I really like this this display. I know I'm not going to buy it because it's going to be too expensive and I, I don't use it as much. But like in my dreams, I work from home 100% of the time and I can justify paying like two grand for this monitor. Yeah, that would probably be the price. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OLED that big. It's like we're getting like TV territory now. Yeah, but there's also Philips who released a, well, they call it the screen a, a, a monitor, but it's a 43-inch display uh, that it's, I think it's a like it's a 4K display, 43 inch, but it's like a monitor, so it has a very fast response time, and all the ports for a computer. But yeah, 43 inch is, is basically a television now, so it doesn't make sense uh, to think of this as a little monitor. <laughs> so Smug Mug buys Flickr, so that wasn't unexpected. So first of all, I thought Smug Mug Smug Mug was this like little company. I'm surprised it's not the other way around. I like read the headline three times and even sing it to you this morning. I was like, oh, so Flickr buys Smug Mug. You're like, no, no, no. Smug Mug buys Flickr. Yeah. <laughs> but um, first of all, I'm surprised Smug Mug is still there because I I remember I joined that community a long time ago, but I really haven't gone then on, on it since. I think I joined when Flickr was purchased. So as a, uh, just a way to maybe have a, Plan B, if ever I stopped using Flickr, but in the end I stopped using Flickr, but it didn't need a plan B. So. <laughs> and Flickr is owned right now by Yahoo. So I guess yeah. they bought it from Yahoo or something. Yeah. They didn't yeah, buy I Yahoo, mean, <laughs> right? They just no, bought no, Flickr. Well, well, Yahoo is now this big uh, company called Auth or something. Yeah, with, with Verizon, I think, or something. Whatever. Yeah, Verizon purchased it and then they kind of like made its own s- subsidiary thing. or something. Right. So yeah, they, they they bought it for I don't know, yeah we don't know exactly the amount, but yeah, Smug Mug, which is a family owned company, uh, they acquired Flickr and everything, so you will still be able to log in using your Yahoo account, uh, but everything will now be under Smug Mug, and hopefully they can uh, make it better because at one time it was amazing. Uh, in the best 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 days, they had like seventy four million users and. 100 million unique visitors uh, like every month and they they, they had crazy numbers like uh, 100 million unique users who post tens of billions of photos like it's it's huge numbers so at one point it was understandably the biggest community but as soon as Flickr acquired it they basically stopped developing it and that's that's how it was since then nothing really happened on that community and even I was a paying member. I was a pro user, and I was paying the twenty five bucks per month uh, per year, and that gave me like a bunch of new features. And over the years, that price increased, and the features de- uh, decreased. So it was getting a worse and a worse deal. And after a certain time, I figured I don't really use it anymore, so let's stop paying. Even though I was grandfathered in with that lower price, I was still losing features. So it was just a shit show, and I decided to just close my not close my account, but stop paying and stop using it. I'd really like like this third party photo um like photo not how do you call it not photo management but if, like picture photo community. Yeah, photo community so I can upload all my pictures from there and have a uh like 
fifth backup from all these like the local thing I have the the iCloud backup I have and just have like this separate entity that that has all my pictures yeah because for Flickr it's weird because there's two types of people there's a type of people who use Flickr as let's just put my best photos there and use it as a 500px kind of website and there's also the people who are using this as a memory card uploader machine so they just take your memory card they drag and drop everything from the memory card to the Flickr uploader and they upload everything to Flickr and eventually make it nice and tidy in little folders and subjects or whatever. So it depends on how you want to use it. So yes, if you use it that way, it can be like another backup. I don't think that Flickr tempers with the files, so they should retain the full resolution and everything. But then again, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Maybe it's going to change. Maybe it's going to be better or worse. We'll have to see. But yeah, it's a, it's, it's a pretty flexible service. And now Amazon, which is now ringing the doorbell and getting inside your house to drop packages, is now trying to do the same thing with your trunk. How come? Um, they offer this new, I think it's in test right now, this new option, delivery option. They can d drop it off directly in the trunk of your car. So I think it's a partnership with OnStar. Um, I, and Volvo. And Volvo, right. OnStar was big, like the... I remember when I, was like, when I was a kid in the 90s, it was like huge because you could just press this button and you'd call this person that would call, they would like answer all your questions or unlock your car and a bunch of stuff. So like they already have OnStar set to be able to unlock your car and, and open the trunk, I guess. So Amazon hooked up to this and you can have um, them drop off stuff in your car at work, at home. I think it has to be close to your, like your delivery address or something. Like as a fallback? Yeah, it needs to be in a certain perimeter of the delivery address. And you need also to provide indications of your car brand, color, and type so the delivery person can look it up and find it easily. And also, it's a really... Uh, what I like about this service is that it's a very streamlined process, meaning that at any time before they actually open the trunk, you can cancel the delivery there. So you know exactly when the package is being delivered, you know when the package arrived to the destination and they're looking for your car. You know once they found your car and you know once they hit the button to open the trunk and you know when they hit the button to close the trunk. Like everything is like step by step so you can really follow it very precisely. And at any step before the actual delivery, you can cancel it and say, oh no, you know what, forget it, drop it at work or whatever at the address on the order. And the delivery guy will just turn around and change its route to go to the building or whatever the address that you mentioned in your order. So for some reason, I don't feel as bad as the one with the, the house. It's a lot better. <laughs> the yeah, house is well, way worse. Yeah, I know. But like, there's people who have valuables in the car at all times, which is crazy to me. But there's people who just keep like iPads in the trunk and yeah, laptops but then like that. Everybody has valuables in their house at all time. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. So not everyone has that in their car. And also, it's only the trunk. And they don't have access to the doors. So in theory, most model of cars, you cannot go to the, like, get the seat down. There's many models that you cannot. So there's a lot less troubles there, possibly. And yeah, and it's also easier for them because they don't have to find maybe the uh, the building or the, 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 the suite number or whatever. It's hard for them to find. And you might have, uh, oftentimes, delivery people saying that, oh, uh, the recipient wasn't there. But in, the, in reality, they just never found the place or they never took the time to find the place. So that might be a way for them to do a faster delivery. So it's interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd do this like a hundred times before doing the open my door and drop it in the house thing. Yeah, I think we have less of a problem here uh, for uh, stolen packages. In the state, it seems to be a real crazy problem right now. Like there's people actually like, hiding like uh, 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 firecrackers and cameras and electric stuff just to like scare people who tries to steal packages. I think it's in, in the States, it's getting crazy. Like they, those people know what types of boxes to look for. And especially when it's like iPhone delivery season or whatever. Uh, well, I don't know why, why you would first of all drop a an iPhone on the porch and leave it there. That for me makes no sense. You should require a signature. But I think that with the amount of packages that they delivered that week, that's probably what they're doing just because they don't want to go back and forth with like 400 packages in every truck. 
But still, in the States, it seems to be a real problem. And I understand why Amazon is trying to do that because for them, it's huge cost. Because if the package doesn't arrive, if you don't have your package, you report it as missing and they ship you another one right away and like no fees. So if it's a toothbrush, not a big deal. But if it's like a, a, an iPod or if it's a, a display or whatever, uh, that can like increase their losses quite quite a lot, especially in the States with the number of people there. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a great idea. I think anything that they can do to alleviate those costs. And I think this solution with the car is much better than the house also for what you, the reason you said. Uh, but it's also easier to understand and easier to process because it goes through GM or Volvo. So it's another partner, which is a reliable partner, which has a track record right now of being a good partner. So probably it's going to be better received than open the door, drop the package and run away with, the, I don't know, your, your TV or whatever. And also, I think this problem in the States is because a lot more people use Amazon than, than we have it here. And a lot more people are prime subscribers and actually like rely 100% on on Amazon. Yeah. But also, I think also here, maybe we just don't have that problem yet. Uh, I know a couple of years ago, I was testing the Sonos speaker set. So I g got from the Sonos rep a, pl a play bar, a Sonos sub, and I think I had like two play twos. And it came from FedEx. So I was figuring out that, okay, if I'm not there, they'll come back the next day. I will from home the next day and I'll be fine. But they left it on the porch and my porch is facing the street. So anyone who would pass by in car or by foot would see. And, it, and the worst thing is that the boxes, they were the product boxes. So you would see from the street, so no play bar, so no sub. There was like $2,000 worth of speakers on my, on my porch. And I got home and I was like, oh my God, everything is there. I'm so happy. But I was so scared that, and I, I think the delivery was made like at 10 a.m., So it like spent maybe f six or seven hours there <laughs> and no one touched it. So I'm, I was pretty, uh, pretty okay. because uh, I was scared to just get home and realize that they did the delivery and everything was gone. So, <laughs> yeah, I have the same problem with Amazon. They leave everything on my porch, like regardless of the price, it's just, it's the box and it's directly on the porch. And like you, we can see the porch from, from the street. There's no, like nothing hiding the front door or nothing. Yeah, that's bad. All right, so moving on to a MKBHD video. He did a iPhone X, iPhone 10, six month later video uh, discussing basically if the iPhone is still uh, what is what it was when it came out. Uh, now that the hype died down and that other devices are now on the market, like does it still worth one thousand dollars? Is it still the best uh, one of the best headset out there? And he makes a pretty nice. Uh, arguments there about yes it still is a great device still worth what it is um he also has a i think it was it's now his second iphone because he broke the first one so yeah it's interesting and he, he also mentions mentioned that there's still no red iphone 10 and he figured out that it's probably because there it's hard to make stainless steel in red but then he thought for a second and said hmm, if the screen is black and the back is red and the stainless steel is black It would be pretty dope. So, and I agree with him. Even if it's hard to make a stainless steel in red, why bother? Just leave it black, and black and red will be amazing. So, yeah, maybe we'll see that next year. I don't know. Yeah, we were guessing that it'd be like two, three weeks after the the iPhone 8 to like match the the initial launch of the iPhone 8 versus the iPhone 10. But I think we're up to that date now, and we haven't seen anything. Yeah, nothing. So it's probably not going to happen. And talking about the iPhone 10, uh, it's funny, like, people, I don't know if people keep telling you that your phone model will be canceled and it's been a while. it'll be removed. It's been a while. Okay, yeah. good. But it, it's it's impressive when you look at the numbers. Like, the iPhone 10 basically got 35% of the profits from Q4 2017. So for a phone that is super expensive, for a phone that supposedly didn't sell well, according to some sources... It still got in a third of the profits, more than a third of the profits of Q4 2017. So for the holiday quarter, the one where lots of people make purchases, one third of the profits, not the sales, the profits came to Apple for this model phone. So it's pretty impressive for a unpopular device. So talking about unpopular device, there's uh, finally word from Apple about the whole Wi-Fi business, uh, which has been 
in, I would say, frozen to death uh, since 2013 when they released the uh, Airport Extreme with uh, 802.11ac. Uh, since that 2013 release, nothing really happened. There were a bunch of uh, firmware updates since, but nothing major, no major new features. So it was clear for everyone that this was basically put on the back burner and just supported and nothing new came out. But now it's finally official. Apple is officially out of the Wi-Fi business and they propose uh, different devices depending on what your Apple products are and what a Wi-Fi uh, router you should use so with your devices. So after so many years, it's finally official. Apple is out. The competition is fierce, especially since they started to release the, the mesh uh, network devices like the Linksys Velop and the Eero of this world. It's been pretty pretty increased in terms of uh, competitors and also uh, product offerings. And the feature is pretty pretty great. The feature set is very, very large. Uh, there's partner control, there's a bunch of customization. And if you really need to push that envelope further, if you want to get that Eero performance, but a maybe harder to configure but still a much more much more powerful there's now the ubiquity company who releases uh, normally a ton of professional devices for businesses they now have a mesh network for the home so for pro users from home or small businesses they have the amplify line of products which works basically the same as the eero the base model is one cube which is the router and two antennas that plugged in the wall uh, there are no cables because it plugs in directly on the power outlet. And if you need more power, there's also uh, additional units you can buy for uh, either antennas or the cube itself. You can get up to three cubes, I think, or maybe more than three cubes, which would be basically the, the router. And the cool thing about this product is that the display has, well, there's a display, first of all. So it's a cube. So the front face of the cube has a display and tells you in real time what is your upload and download speed. So at any time, you can look at this display and know if your network is down or up and possibly other information. I haven't seen many, many, many screenshots. So every time I look at those screenshots, it's always just the download and upload speed. So And the cool thing is that there's an option also, which is pretty nice for people that are, uh, that are going a lot on vacation or traveling for work. There's a little device you can buy that's going to phone home and use your home Wi-Fi as a VPN for when you're outside of uh, your house. So if you want to have it, not necessarily cheap, but a device without any recurring fee that allows you to access the same Netflix and the same resources as when you're at home, but when you're in another country, you can use that VPN thing to phone home and use your network as your backbone if you want, of your VPN. So that's pretty cool. And this is pretty sad news because until like very recently, you kept testing routers and always coming back to the 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 airport extreme so it was a pretty solid router and i think in general people really liked it and now it's not even available anymore and it's they're not it's clear that they're not going to replace it either so yeah yeah in terms of reliability over the last let's say 15 years uh the airport extremes were the devices that were for me the most reliable and they were rock solid i got uh, three different models and all of them were super fast and super solid uh, I basically had to reboot them maybe once a year at most and the rest of the time it was super steady no matter what devices I had in the network with NASes, with computers working has like dedicated media centers everything was super rock steady and since then I moved on to the Eros uh, Pro uh, Wi-Fi mesh network uh, I tried other mesh networks that were f also fast, but not as reliable or as configurable. And the one that I ended up keeping and using on my daily, uh, in, in every day in my house is the Eero one. Uh, I'm curious about that Ubiquiti one though. So uh, I'll probably have to check this one out just to be, just on a curious side. Like, can, can I get like faster or more reliable and can I get stronger signals? Right now I have problems outside my house if I'm like in uh, on my driveway. I do have the uh, Wi-Fi connected, but it's not fast enough to get and send data. But in, also, if I go in my yard, in the back, same problem. So maybe this one could help. We'll see. I, th I think your house is lined with, with like foil. 
Yes, it is. So it's very isolated. So that doesn't really help for everything. Even my phone, like my, my cell phone in the basement has troubles. I have drop calls, which I never had over the last 10 years. But in this house, in this basement, uh, it's hard to keep a call. When I get a call on my cell phone, I have to stand up and go next to a window just to be sure that the line won't cut. So it's pretty well insulated. I can I can second that Eero thing because it's I've had it since December and it's been rock solid. I've never had to restart and I've never had this slow Wi-Fi or anything. It's it's really bulletproof. Yep, amazing product. All right, moving on to your wrist. Uh, there are rumors <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, I hate my transitions. They, they really suck sometimes. So yeah, moving on to your wrist. Uh, WatchOS 4.3.1 is now suggesting that we might have third-party watch faces. Uh, I don't know how you feel about this, but I, as much as I want to be able to have a different watch face, maybe something that's better suited for me, I don't know how I feel about opening that up to anyone because you'll get some awful watches there. Unless they ask for him to be reviewed by Apple and they say, like, no, this one is too ugly. Yeah, but now you fall into a a realm of somebody else doesn't like it but for you there's a value so it, where's the line it's, it's not like a guideline which will be clear like you cannot say that make your watch face look nice that's not something you can enforce right you could probably have them reviewed of so that at least they're not like crappy 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 looking but at one point that they're, 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 I don't know how you can manage that because there's going to be like a fine line between ugly and featureful, but not that prius thing. So I don't know. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe this opens up to partnerships or that this allows Apple themselves to make more flexible watch faces and offer you more uh, options. Perhaps not all pre-installed on the watch. Maybe there's could be like a kind of a, a, a watch face app and that you go in a kind of a like gallery of different watch faces and you install the one that you see fit. And these would have maybe more features, more interesting designs like the Kaleidoscope Kali, 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 one or the Siri watch face, which is very different from anything else uh, in the current choices. That might be a way to do it. Uh, not necessarily opening up to everyone, but maybe just opening up to more possibilities still from Apple or maybe with partnerships. I don't know. It's, But I don't feel that opening this up to everyone is the way to go. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see it, but I'd open it up. I'd open it up to everyone. And then you can just, yeah. like you, you know how you share like workflows? Yeah. You can do like something like that, like like kind of curated, but you they're all accepted. Yeah, true. And if you have a good list of featured one, maybe these are the ones that are mostly going to be installed. And unless you are looking for a very specific one, you need to search for it or drill down 15 pages of watch faces. Yeah. Yeah, that, that could work. That could work. If there's a way, if there's a good system to classify them and feature them, that could be also a way to do it. And the best ones are just going to be more popular and rise to the top, like naturally. Yeah, exactly. Or cool. it's going to be like iMessage. I message applications and we're just going to forget about it after like two weeks. Oh, yeah. And stickers and Animoji and the list goes on. Yeah. Discussing personalized Animojis, uh, there's now a new post on the Machine Learning Journal from Apple on personalized Hey Siri. So there's a big post there uh, explaining the reason behind uh, a, the motivation basically behind having an Hey Siri that is personalized, not that the words are personalized, but that the speaker recognition is there and that there's user-specific information that they can use. So I don't know. I think that's the first time that they discuss a feature that they still don't have. So it, <laughs> it's, it, it, no, but it, it, Apple is super secretive that usually when you see something on that blog or on other public-facing documentation, it's always about features that they have released. Right. But in this case, they don't have a customized Hey Siri. So if you or your wife say Hey Siri, the first device picks it up and tries to process it. But it doesn't know if it's you or your wife or if you ask it to add an item to your calendar, it's going to add it to the device that responded calendar, which might not be the right one. So 
But this is interesting. Like right now, when I say the, the trigger word, my phone lights up, my my wife's phone lights up, and then the HomePod picks it up. So it's wow. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> the only one I imagine yeah. I managed to trigger like um, on its own, even though the HomePod is close, is my watch because I can stick it right close to my face and almost whisper to it, and then she can add stuff to my grocery list or start a timer or something like that. Yeah, but that's way too far from the promise of the device that will pick it up is the one that should pick it up and process it accordingly. You need to walk on in hex shells just, just to make the right one trigger and whisper. And You shouldn't, as a user, need to think about this. It should just work. And I was in my, I was in my bed and I was trying to get Siri to, to open, um, not to turn on Do Not Disturb last night. And the HomePod was picking it up in in the <laughs> in the living room in the base and in, in downstairs. And what did she reply? Mm-hmm. Or whatever there. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid thing she does when she doesn't understand. I still I still feel this so weird. Like uh huh. Mm-hmm. I'm like what the. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's just a little bit too much human. Like they they have to turn it down a notch because at this point it's I don't know it's 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 weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> stop it yeah, it's that's, weird no that's what I'm saying I'm just <laughs> confirming that it's weird so I answer mm-hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> oh jeez alright let's switch to the next news next news there's a post on a blog called The Shape of Everything from uh, August Mwetter he's saying something interesting he's saying that Apple should make an Instagram clone the, I like the premise uh we know that Apple can be good at services when they put their heart to it. Like, for example, iMessages, which the peak a couple of years ago was 200,000 iMessages at once being processed, sent, or received. That's pretty amazing. But making a whole social app with photos, I think Apple has all of the building blocks for that. They have a nice photo app on all their platform. They have nice cameras on their devices, even on the iPads, and I can see like a Instagram clone from Apple, but the problem would always be the social part of it. Apple is not the best at social design, if you want, for for apps and social networks, but nothing prevents them from building it using employees that they would poach from Instagram or whatever. Uh, And he even proposed to have a developer API, grow it slowly with beta invites, so... I, I would agree. Like, I would be happy to have this kind of uh, services open to everyone. There's also the part about username, which is Instagram for a long time was tied to your Twitter account. And now not anymore, but there's no uh, username on the I, Apple ID. So there's a bunch of user behavior there to to define and under, make streamline, basically. But uh, I agree that it would make sense. Yeah, I, yeah, because I've, I don't use Instagram anymore. I've since the stupid timeline, <laughs> I I just well, that's, that's the thing. Fallen out of Apple love, could so do it right. I, I'm open to a new a new option. And there will be no ads because it's already being paid by a little chip of your iPhone purchase every couple of years. So that could work. Also, they have a ton of users, which also can make this app go from zero to. I don't know, like 100 million users pretty quick in a couple of weeks. So that would also help them have a good traction and maybe attract more. And I don't know if they would go as far as, far as copying all the features of Instagram and maybe adding more, but it could also integrate some of the, uh, what's the um, Clips app? Yeah, all of those little tools, editing features could be integrated into the, the app itself. Or you edit in clip and then open in Apple Instagram or whatever you call that thing, and that I can work. just do like Instagram and copy everything from from uh, Snapchat. Snapchat, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah. And instead of copying the copier, go copy it directly the, the original creator. Exactly. Yeah. Skip the middleman. Yeah. Exactly. All right, and also we learned that Amazon they finally released. A number. Uh, the the this company is pretty notorious for having bezels charts, which are basically charts with no access. Well, with access but no numbers on them. 
so you know that it was a record setting quarter you we learn we have more users than ever but you never know exactly numbers it's always like just a little line on the chart and okay you see it's bigger than it was but by a factor of what you don't know but this time around we learned that amazon has worldwide 100 million prime subscribers so with an average of about 90 bucks per user per year that's a lot of money just for prime subscriber and then those prime subscribers uh, according to amazon they purchase more online and they purchase more often so that that allows them to make even more money so yeah it's a it's impressive uh the price will increase i read somewhere that i think it goes from 19 99 dollars per year to 119 so i i'm a prime subscribers uh, subscribers subscriber in canada and i'm paying 79 dollars per year so hopefully i'm going to be grandfathered in and not feel that increase because right now if it's 99 in the u.s it should already be more than that in canada but for me, it's still 79. We're not going to tell anybody. Really, yeah. Please keep this down. Yeah. <laughs> Shh. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, it's pretty impressive. Uh, 100 million is a big number. It's a... And especially Amazon, it works in a way that is very different than other companies that they don't run for profit. They reinvest almost everything that they make into the company or projects or stuff so that they keep on growing. They keep on doing stuff differently and better. But they don't just sit on a pile of money and just keep it like that. It's 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 always reinvested. So this just tells us that there's way way more billions of revenues per year than than I thought. Yeah, that's very impressive. And also, I think how much um like this is a hundred million we said, and then how many people are subscribed to Apple services, whatever? I think it's two hundred fifty million. Yeah, I think that's the number I heard recently. And then what's the? There was a couple when we were when this when this news came out. There was a couple that people were listing there. There's like Amazon, and then there's Netflix also. That's a hundred million. Uh, yes. Or just a little bit also. under or something. Yeah, maybe eighty-five or ninety million or something. And then there's Spotify also, I think. Yeah, but you have to watch out because the price is always different. Right. Like, say a hundred bucks per year. It's less than ten bucks per month. Uh, Netflix is about if you, if you have four 4K or 1080p multiple devices, can be from 12 to 15 bucks. So it's a bit more money than Amazon, Apple. It can be also 99 bucks, 99 cents per month. So that's 12, just 12 bucks per year. So you need to watch out on the exact spread of the money there. But yeah, it, it still is impressive numbers, and I don't think there's any other company offering that type of service. Uh, meaning that for a single price like this, which is less than 10 bucks per month, would account for Prime Videos, super fast shipping, uh, like two-day shipping, and oftentimes even free one-day shipping, and a bunch of other features. Uh, you have, I think there's a lightning deal you can get half an hour earlier. So if you're into uh, impulse buying stuff like that, uh, you can get good deals before everyone else. And usually when everyone else jumps on it, there's no more stock. So, for example, um, the SNES Classic little console, I was able to buy it from Walmart. But the NES Classic, I was able to buy it from Amazon because I was a Prime member and because we had like a little window of you can only pre-order this console if you're a Prime member. So I got it because of that. So some little advantages there. Also, when the Nintendo Switch was released, they had... Uh, special deal on the games. So if you were buying it through Prime, you would get like 12 bucks off the game. So you see, it's not that much, but I was able to pre-order like four games like that and I saved about 50 bucks and it was almost the price of my whole year of subscription right off the bat from those pre-orders. So there's ways to get a good deal out of that. Yeah, Netflix is 125 million. So we're trying to okay. see if this... If like Amazon Prime Video is the most, um, is it like this, the video service with the most subscribers? Because I feel like yeah. Netflix is a lot more popular than Amazon Prime Video. First of all, the True. name is horrible, but. Yeah, well, yeah, Amazon in the names is also a problem by its own. But, uh, but it's not just that. It's Netflix. You have only one revenue, which is the subscription. But Amazon also makes money, profits of sales. And credit card 
transactions and stuff like that. So there, there's also like another stream of revenue, which is not accounted for in that 100 million users. That's just raw revenues from subscription. Then there's also the all the other revenues they have from other uh, pipelines. Yeah, I was just looking so, at it on a video platform, like numbers thing. Yeah. Talking about video, there's a crazy rumor going on that Apple is working on an AR and VR headset that weirdly includes 8K monitors for your eyes. So th this one is, is pretty far-fetched. Uh, I don't know how much we should read into this one. Um, they even say it's for 2020 and they're making their own chips, which will be more powerful than anything they did in the past. Which is makes sense because every year the chips are faster and stronger and more efficient. Uh, the project codename T two eight eight is in very very early stages, so I don't know if this ties back to the Zeiss partnership they had a couple months ago, trying to make a glass that is optimized for AR, but also can it be adapted to your eyesight. But this one it kind of like pushes everything to the boundary. It, it it seems to me that this is the kind of rumor that comes from like a single slide on a whiteboard or something that says, here's all the features on the market. Let's try to have them all in one device. Like, let's check, check all the boxes. Because VR, VR and AR in the same device, that's pretty far-fetched. 8K monitors for your eyes. At this size, the pixel will need to be super small and, or the screen's very big. I don't know how big uh, there's are other companies that are just making like AR stuff like Magic Leap and by itself that product is hard to make now you have an AR and a VR in the same thing you have its own custom chip you have probably other custom hardware uh, it, it it's too much I think it doesn't really make sense for me and it's supposed to be little glasses well it doesn't really say uh, I'm thinking it's the AR part would be tied to the Zeiss partnership that they got running for a couple of months now working on a way to make something that is translucent, but also has um, AR attached information or pixels there. But they also mentioned VR. So there's also maybe a mode where you can just flip a screen or something and now you're totally immersed. I have no, under no, no clue how this whole thing would work. But uh, So I just paid to get rid of glasses and now you're telling me that I'm have to gonna buy, I'm going to have to put another pair of glasses on to have this thing? <laughs> You got it right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known. Few, I should have known. <laughs> a few more thousand dollars yeah. for, for your eyes again yeah. next year. Well, in two years. <laughs> Get, sorry, can you can you like undo what you just did? Because I want to wear glasses again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know what to think about this one. This one is, I think, it's, for me, it seems to be too far-fetched. It's. I think they're just trying to get every box checked and then put that in a single product. But I don't think that's the product they're building. They might be looking at different avenues and different post potential products, but everything in one, that's too much. And I we had a, like a lunch and learn at, at work. It's like a like completely random subject that somebody wants to present and we all learn and, and eat. <laughs> and, yeah. and somebody was doing like a lunch and learn on VR he was prepping for his um, like his conference talk that he was giving in Quebec City or something. It was really interesting, but I keep like thinking, I keep saying to myself, like I don't, I don't think I really like VR. Like the whole headset thing is kind of weird, and it's not really like it doesn't do anything unless you play games. Like what am I going to watch a show in in VR? I don't know. Yeah, well, I agree with you. It's it's only ex exclusively for gaming in my opinion i tried uh the google uh what's it called cardboard that little card box no, yeah not the cardboard the one that's a bit better than that made of daydream uh, fabric yeah daydream yeah and i watched netflix on it <laughs> and the way that they presented you is that you're sitting in a, in a living room that's in a chalet up in the mountains it's a so cottage it's like <laughs> a cottage yeah it's a chalet like a chalet swiss yeah like a chalet swiss <laughs> so and the way that they presented you is that you're in a fake living room and you have on your left a window, on your right you have movie posters and in front of you have a big, big screen. So it was cute, but I still prefer to watch TV normally. 
So for me, it's just trying to apply VR to something that is not made for VR. And there's always people trying to force things with new technologies. And I agree that for me, VR is made for immersive gaming. It was always, for me, the single most important feature of VR. And I think, well, apart from like medical usage and stuff like that. And but porn. Mm, Everything is useful in porn. Yeah, okay. It yeah, all starts okay, from there. Always, <laughs> it always starts from there, exactly. <laughs> they, push off, they push everything uh, forward. Um, so, yeah, so, so I agree with you. VR, gaming, perfect. But otherwise, it makes no sense. Uh, especially the, the other thing is that it's gaming, yes, but it's one player gaming because you don't stay in the living room with your friends and put on VR headsets and use that for gaming in groups. It makes no sense. You have to be basically everyone is in their own living room and they could collaborate online, but you don't, you don't, you're not in a part in the same living room. So it, it's, it's also for a single user experience. But do people really do that any days uh, nowadays? Like, come to my house and let's play or don't they all play online i think they all play online uh, usually when people have vr headset nowadays they just make vr parties if you want and people try it one after the other they play a scary game and they piss on their pants and that's it but it's not for let's all put our headsets because there's no computer or console that is strong enough to provide vr for more than one headset right that's just so a question unless, of time yeah but unless you have like let's say like four TVs, four consoles, and four headset. But even then, I don't think there's many, many games that are VR and networked. So it's still uh, still far-fetched to me. Um, the AR part, though, it's better because you can still be aware of your surroundings. And let's take a super simple example. The Microsoft uh, demo we got a couple months and years ago about having Minecraft played on a coffee table. So with their headset, uh, imagine there's like two, three kids in a living room sitting around a coffee table and actually building the Minecraft blocks on the coffee table. But they're still in a living room. They still see each other. They can talk, they can interact, and they can play on the same game. Very much like a classic board game, but virtual. And that makes more sense. You potentially need less power also to provide only a set of model rendered on a surface then having the whole environment being 3d and vr and aware of your movements and everything so you could potentially even nowadays have maybe a four headset ar game on a modern console that would could even be possible so that's why apple going to the vr side of things doesn't really make sense to me I sit more like AR with apps like they're used to and they are best at right now and perhaps push, push this further with partners and companies making games or other stuff that are interesting. But AR, VR, and one, it's, it's just too far-fetched. All right, so let, let's go back to uh, one of our early, early, early subjects in this podcast, which is Coffee Corner. Uh, it's been a while since I've did any Coffee Corner uh, I got a new little device this week, and I was pretty, pretty skeptic when, when skeptic when I saw it online. Um, as you know, I have a Nespresso machine, and I've been using for many many years over different machines uh, reusable cups. So they're made of plastic, black plastic. You fill them with your coffee, your very own uh, preferred types of coffee that you grind uh, the same day, just to get some freshness there. Uh, they always work. They are not the best, meaning that. I'm able to get the crema, just like the Nespresso, if I get the very, very, very precise uh, grinding size and also the very precise uh, tempering. So you don't need to, you need to temper your coffee a little bit. Not too much, not too much, because if you press it too much, then the coffee machine will only drip uh, little droplets of coffee at a time and it's not going to work very well and your coffee quantity will be less. Or if you don't temper it enough or you grind it too coarse, then you get just, a, just like brown waters. And that is not coffee, like a semi-transparent brown water. So it's not the greatest. They, but the, uh, also known as Tim Hortons. <laughs> yeah, and Tim Hortons and McDonald's <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that. So there are solutions where I've seen a couple of them over the years where you can purchase either 
off-brand cups that are pre-filled with some other company's coffee. Or you can buy cups that needs uh, you to fit them with coffee and then apply some kind of foil to close them. And sometimes it's stickers, sometimes it's little holders. So there's a bunch of different ways. And I'm like, everything seems cheap and not well done and shouldn't work really well. But then I stumbled across a blue cup uh, coffee system, basically. It's that exact same thing. You got your cups that are made of hard plastic, uh, two colors. So it's always blue and purple. That's their branding color. Very nicely done. And on the top and bottom of the lip, there's a little rubber part, kind of like a little gasket. And they provide you with pre-folded uh, foil cups, uh, cap if you want. But the, the imp impressive thing there is that if you were just to put this on and use your fingers, it wouldn't be really tight, it wouldn't be really well done. They provide you with a little gizmo that is made of two parts. You unscrew it, you put your cup in, you put the coffee in, you put the foil, then you close the second part on top and you just twist it. And by twisting it, it wraps the foil around the lip and air tights it, sealed. So it's a uh, sealed from the air and it's ready to be used. And the cool thing is that my first impressions are pretty great because I said, okay, well, let's try this. So I did it perfectly lined up and everything. Everything is super nice, works well. And then a couple of cups later, I misplaced the little foil and it was not really sort of going around the lip. It was off-centered a bit. Still, no problem, works fine. And also I said, okay, let me try something. Let me try to put coffee just by filling it with uh, gravity and just tapping on the sides, not tempering it, not pressing on it, just like that, or by pressing on it, or by trying to fill it as much as I can. And the cool thing is that no matter how much coffee I put in there, I'm always able to get a crema. That's exactly the same one as the Nespresso crema. So I don't know if it's the foil or if it's the way that it's the cup is made, but it's much, much more reliable than the coffee duck uh, little cups I had before. So I'll need to do more tests to be sure that this also works with other types of coffee. Because right now they provided me with an example uh, with a little pouch of coffee that is an espresso coffee that they prefer. That is pre-grinded, I think, for this uh, size of, uh, of cups. But I need to try my own coffee also and exactly see if it behaves the same way. If this is really as easy as I think. I looked at the video. It looks really cool. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Uh, in terms of, of um, device and quality made for those cups and the little gizmo there to turn, uh, it's pretty high quality. It's it's plastic uh, that is injected molded and it's very sturdy pieces with thick plastic. And seriously, it's it's very simple to use. And yesterday for fun, I just filled my... my, my I got... I think that it comes with two cups in, in the box and they also gave me a little six pack of cups uh, in extra. And I think it comes with the 100 foils. So it, I'm good for a little while. And so I filled all eight just for fun. And like I said, I misaligned one or two. And I tried them yesterday and they were fine. So uh, for me, this type of product needs two things. To be efficient, to work and give you the nice crema. But also it needs to be uh, error prone. Well, not error prone, but uh, it needs to still work if you're doing it wrong or slightly wrong or off-centered or something like that. Because that's really when you have the, the problems. And if the machine or the system or whatever doesn't work well, that's when you get irritated and you need to like remove the coffee and retry. And that, you don't want that. So if this thing can do both perfectly, then I will be strongly recommending the product. For now, my first couple of cups, I think I did, I did the eight yesterday and I drank maybe two and I drank two previous days. So I only did like four coffees, but first impressions are pretty good. I have a live update thing. Um, you were talking about you were worried Amazon Prime would come up in the in Canada as well. I found it's not going to come up. It's going to stick at at seventy nine. Oh, nice! So I guess cool. they have more options in the states. That's why it's going up in the states. But we have the same seventy nine price here. What what more options do they have in the states? Like more uh, maybe more features, more products are available, or more content okay. on Amazon Prime Video. I'm guessing or. That's why they're trying to justify the the higher price. Okay, yeah, because here we have Prime Music. Oh, we have Prime Music. I didn't know that. Prime Photos, Prime Videos. Ah, Prime Photos. I have to use that also. Jeez, so many features I don't even use. Because <laughs> I use the two day shippings. I use the uh, Prime Video, of course. Uh, Amazon Family. What is that? 
hmm, I need to investigate. And I also used maybe once the lightning deals. But yeah, it's uh, pretty interesting. Also, students get 50% off, which is interesting. To get them while they're young. Exactly. That's how it works. Marketing, my friend. Yes. (laughs) Target the poor. (laughs) Target the the young, (laughs) not the poor. (laughs) Well, sometimes it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's it for episode 88. You can find the show notes at rgba.fm slash 88. You can find us on Twitter at underscore rgba.fm. You can find me personally on Twitter at Valia, V-A-L-L-I-E-R-E-S. And I'm Charlie Menard, T-Y-L-E-R-M-E-N-A-R-D. Have a nice week. Have a nice week. <laughs>